Hi, my name is Cynthia Rudin, and I'm going to tell you why we should stop explaining black box machine learning models for high stakes decisions and use interpretable models instead. And I want to point out that bad stuff is happening now. There are bad um, bail and parole decisions being made because people type the wrong number into a black box model. It's letting dangerous people go free and it's keeping people in prison who don't deserve to be there. Um, we have um, problems where algorithms depend on factors that are actually not allowed, like in a medical diagnosis where um, uh, the models are depending on words in the image rather than the medical content of the, of the image. Uh, we also have uh, bad credit and loan decisions being made on faulty information. And um, I claim that um, explainable machine learning actually perpetuates this problem. So um, why is that? Well, first of all, we don't need black box models in the first place. And I'll give you some evidence for why that's true um, shortly. And then also explanation methods. So explaining black boxes actually tend to lend authority to the black boxes. So, so people try to sort of make excuses for these models rather than consider replacing them with models that are, that are actually interpretable in the first place. Okay, so I want to contrast that I'm, you know, I, I'm, con I'm contrasting two different things. Explainable machine learning, which is where you take a black box and explain it afterwards. So this is a post hoc analysis of a black box. Um, versus interpretable machine learning where you use a model that's just not a black box. You know, there, there's a lot of reasons why explaining these models is not the same thing at all as designing inherently interpretable models. And in fact, there's a real chasm in uh, between these two things. Okay, so I think the, the sort of key argument here is that um, the, the reason we don't seem to need black box models is because the accuracy interpretability trade-off doesn't really have scientific backing. So a lot of people really think that you have to make um, a sacrifice in performance, predictive performance, to gain interpretability. But that actually n doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so I have here uh, an image from the DARPA Explainable AI BAA. And um, this image has a lot of problems with it. So um, first of all, the axes aren't quantified, right? There's no actual problem that, that corresponds to this image, okay? So the person who wrote this image was trying to show that if you want to get really excellent quality learning performance, you have to sacrifice a ton in explanation effectiveness, whatever that means. Um, and if you have very, very interpretable or explainable models, then your learning performance is really it uh, has to be sacrificed. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's no actual application that this image corresponds to. Um, it's just, this is just sort of mathiism here. Um, but even so, um, let's, say that the, let's say that they had actually quantified everything and there was an actual problem involved. Um, there's a whole problem with this, with this entire setup because it looks like they're working with a static data set and a fixed evaluation metric. But that's not the way we typically do data science. When we do data science, we follow a data science process. Like I've put here the KDD process, the knowledge discovery and databases process. If you have better understanding, then you can actually go back and um, do a better job fixing the data set, fixing the evaluation metric. And so actually explanation effectiveness leads to better learning performance and not worse learning performance if you consider the whole cycle. And then also, even if you did fix yourself to say some benchmark data set, um, and you know you just tried a whole bunch of different machine learning methods of different levels of complexity on the problem, you still wouldn't see a trade-off like this. Um, to be honest, it's mostly flat, and I'll show you some examples. And there's a lot of nuance in that statement um, that I'll that I'll talk about during this talk. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's quite a bit of nuance in this statement that there's, that there's no trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. So let me go uh, and, and go into a little more depth on that. So there's really um, two types of data sets, right? There's data sets with tabular data and data sets with raw data. Um, so tabular data is where sort of all the features are interpretable and um, you, you can understand exactly why each feature is a potential 
um, predictor of the outcome. That's tabular data. And, and then you can contrast that with raw data, which are things like you know, image data, where if you adjust one pixel, you're no longer on the manifold of natural images, right? So it's, it's sort of a very different type of, of data. So, you know, images, sound waves, text. Yeah, so, so these, these are very different. Now for raw data, the only type of technique that's working right now for raw data is really neural networks. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't be interpretable. So let's hang on for that one. Now with tabular data, as it turns out, um, all the methods tend to perform very, very similarly on, on tabular data. So um, yeah, so what that means is that you very often can produce very, very sparse models, like sparse decision trees or scoring systems. Like these are scoring systems or sparse linear models with integer coefficients. You can very often produce these tiny little models that are just as accurate as the best, you know, boosted decision tree or neural network that you can um, find on these data, okay? So the fact that the tabular data behaves um, like this uh, really kind of opens the door for us to design these very, very sparse models um, and, and, uh, and expect a high level of accuracy for them. So let's go back to the, uh, I showed a, a picture at the very beginning, um, and that picture is from this New York Times article about Glenn Rodriguez, who he was denied parole because there was a typographical error in his compass score. So compass is a black box model that's used widely in the criminal justice system in the United States. And he had taken his score sheet um, after he was denied parole, at, after the parole board denied his parole, he took his score sheet and compared it with someone else's. And then he realized that there was a, a, a mistake in his criminal history features. So um, yeah, so we were thinking like, okay, how, how accurate is, is Compass, right? Compass is a proprietary black box model. It's sold to the justice system. How accurate is it really? Um, well, so let's take a look. We're gonna look at the ProPublica data from Florida. This is a very famous data set. Um, and you know, you'd think, like I said, you'd think that Compass would be more accurate than a very simple model, but in fact, that's not always the case. And in fact, it's not even usually the case. Okay, so we're comparing, we're gonna do an experiment on the Florida data, comparing the accuracy of compass, which again is a black box model used in the justice system, with corals. And corals is um, just our latest machine learning method in the lab at the time of this experiment. We've done a lot since corals, but um, corals is a method for optimal sparse decision lists. So it's sort of one-sided decision trees or sort of um, if-then rules that are stacked. And Corals produces these tiny little itty bitty models. And in fact, in this case, it produced a model that was so small that it fits in the corner of a PowerPoint slide. So uh, let me show you the model that Corals produces. It doesn't look like a machine learning model, but it is, it's a full blown machine learning model. Um, okay, so the model says, if you are 19 to 20 years old and male, predict that you'll be arrested within two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you're a little older and you have a couple of prior offenses, so two to three prior offenses, then predict arrest within two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you have more than three priors, then predict arrest, otherwise predict no arrest. And we looked at this model and we thought, there is no way <laughs> that this could be as accurate as compass. But as it turns out, it was. Um, and it was really, this was really surprising, right? Um, so. The, uh, the different colors here are different folds of the data. There were 10, 10 folds of the data, so we did cross-validation. And as you can see, they're about equally accurate. But not only that, um, in fact, it doesn't seem to matter which machine learning method we tried, they all seem to perform very similarly. And some of these methods are very powerful black box machine learning methods, like you know boosted decision trees. Um, and then this is support vector machines with radial basis functions. So some of these are models that you can, you know you can't even write down, right? They're so um, they're they're real, really complicated. But they all you know they all seem to perform the same. And um, now, when this data set was released by ProPublica a few years ago, there was a lot of questions about algorithmic fairness of Compass. 
But the truth is that we just don't seem to need compass at all. So why are we still using it, right? I'm not saying we should use the corals model in the justice system. I'm just saying that it does not make any sense to use a black box model with, with hundreds of, of features in the justice system where typographical errors make decisions instead of judges. It just, does not, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so we've talked about the fact that you um, can get these very sparse models for tabular data. But let's switch over and talk about raw data because that's where, as I mentioned, you really need to use a neural network for these types of problems right now. Okay, so but that doesn't mean that, they, that the models can't be interpretable. It's just that interpretability needs to be defined differently for these domains anyway, right? You can't use a sparse decision tree on pixel space, right? It's just not, that's not interpretable. So um, when you're working in this, these problem domains, the question of what actually interpretability means is much more complicated generally than in the, um, in the tabular data problems. So let's try to work with natural images on benchmark data sets, right? So if we could create an inherently interpretable deep convolutional neural network for computer vision, then would you believe me that there isn't a trade-off between accuracy and interpretability, that there isn't an inherent trade-off between these two quantities? Okay, so let's, let's give it a try, right? Let's give it a try. So our first try um, is to use case-based reasoning. Okay, so this is a, I'm gonna introduce to you a network, it's, a, it's what's called a prototype network, and it, um, it makes comparisons of parts of images to um, parts of prototypical images. Okay, so here the network is trying to explain to us why this bird is classified as a clay-colored sparrow. Um, and um, this is a, a difficult vision problem, especially if you don't know anything about birds. All right. So the network is telling us it thinks this bird is a clay-colored sparrow because this part of the bird um, up on top, like where the bird's head is, looks like another part of a prototypical clay-colored sparrow. Okay, and then all the images on the right, those are all prototypical clay-colored sparrows. And then you can see the network is highlighting different parts of, of our bird and showing why it thinks it's similar to these prototypical clay-colored sparrows. Okay, so um, what I'm showing you is, uh, is a result from a, a method called, uh, this looks like that. So what, since because the method sort of highlights parts of the birds and says, this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that. That's why we called the paper, this looks like that. Okay, so um, this looks like that is, it's not, um, it's not exactly uh, Kinder's neighbors, right? But it is case-based reasoning in the sense that it's using parts of a case and comparing them to parts of a prototypical case. Okay, now the way it works is that it adds a prototype layer to a black box. So you take any black box you like, and this method adds a prototype layer to it, which I'll show you in a minute, that forces the network to do case-based reasoning. And the prototypes are learned during training. Right, those prototypes I showed you over here um, um, on the right, those prototypes were learned during training. Okay, so in other words, if you take your favorite black box convolutional neural network and you add a, an additional layer just before the last fully connected layer, that transforms the network to be interpretable. And the way this, um, pr this new prototype layer works is that it, um, it actually scans the image looking for parts of it that look like, that look, you know, that are similar in the latent space to um, these, these parts of these prototypical cases that have been learned during training. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more detail on the, la on the computation of that very last layer there. All right, so let's say that the network is trying to explain to us why this bird up the top there is classified as a red-bellied woodpecker. So what the network does is it finds, right, it, it finds parts of the image and looks at, at and compares them to parts of these prototypical cases. And there are two numbers associated with each comparison. The first number is how similar the network thinks this is to that. 
It's how similar it thinks this part of the bird is similar to this part of this prototypical bird. And then the other number is the class connection weight, which is right here, it's 1.18. And that number is how important that prototype is for representing that class. So here there's, um, you can see the prototype layer there, um, which is the sort of third, third column from the left there. And that's the, that's the set of prototypes, and it's telling us how important each of those prototypes is to the red-bellied woodpecker class. Okay, so for the first comparison, it's looking at the red head on both of these birds, and that gives it a very high similarity score, because apparently the red head is like a real telltale thing that, um, you know, for, for the red-bellied woodpecker class. Okay, so the network is gathering points for each of these comparisons, and we usually use 20 prototypes. So there are 20 numbers here, and the 20 numbers get added together to form a score for the red-bellied woodpecker class. And then, if you, then we actually do this same calculation for all the different classes. And here I'm showing you the, um, the calculation for the red cockaded woodpecker class. And again, there are 20 rows in this uh, table. Um, I'm only showing you the first three. And again, there is similarity scores computed uh, and class connection weights. And then multiplying those together, you get the contributed points. And then the total for this case is um, only 16 points. So the network is pretty sure that this is really a red-pellied woodpecker com as compared to a red cockaded woodpecker or any of the other classes which have lower scores. Um, so the thing about red cockaded woodpeckers is that they don't seem to um, they don't seem to have red heads, and so the network just you know, when it's doing its comparisons, it just, you know, it's noticing a similarity among the feathers of the two, you know, of, of our bird to the red cockaded woodpeckers, but it just can't get the similarity points because of the, the red head. Okay, um, so the data set that I've just been showing you is a benchmark data set in computer vision. So this is where, you know, the, the deepest of the deep neural networks have been compared against each other. And for this data set, uh, we used a whole bunch of different neural networks, black box neural networks, to compare with. Um, and we took each of those black box neural networks and made them interpretable by adding this extra prototype layer. Um, and the range of accuracies we got for the original black box models was between 74 and, and 82%. Um, and then when we added the extra layer, the range of accuracies was sort of right within that range 76 to 80 percent, um, and so uh, you know it's just right in the same range there. But then, if we took a bunch of these interpretable prototype networks and actually put them together, uh, we would still get you know a prototype prototype-based model. It's not as sparse because you've got prototypes from multiple networks there, but it's still it's still doing prototype comparisons, and that combined model um, achieved an 84. 0.8% accuracy, and so is actually better than the black boxes. So we're, what I'm showing you is that um, we didn't seem to really see any loss of accuracy by adding this extra interpretability to the model. So this is, you know, even in the deep, deepest of the deep um, neural network type comparisons here. So even for a computer vision, we can still have an interpretable model of the same accuracy as a black box. So, so far, I'm not seeing any sacrifice in accuracy um, of the interpretable models compared to the black box models. And so, it's not clear to me at this point why we need to be explaining black box models when we can actually build interpretable models instead. So, uh, back to where we were. We've created an inherently interpretable deep convolutional neural network for computer vision. Um, and the, the direct comparison of this method with something like saliency maps, which is a, a, a common way of explaining black box models, is that this, this type of, uh, of, of prototype model is strictly better than saliency because for saliency, it's just telling you where the network is looking, but it doesn't tell you what the network is doing with that information, whereas the prototype network is actually telling you how it's analyzing each image. It's saying not just where I'm looking, but it's telling you what I'm doing with that information. I'm comparing this to that. I think this is similar to that. I think this is similar to that. So it's, it's giving you strictly more information 
than, um, than a saliency computation. And um, its prototype comparisons are not, they're not just simply post hoc explanations. This is actually how the neural network is making its classifications. It's, it's making its classification by doing these comparisons. Okay, so let's try again. Okay, let's, let's give it a second try to, to build an interpretable neural network. Okay, so what if we could disentangle the latent space? What if we could pull information and conduct it along different paths through the neural network? Okay, so what if we could disentangle the latent space to put specific concepts that are human interpretable concepts along the axes? Okay, then would you believe me that there's no sacrifice in accuracy to gain interpretability, right? Can, can we do this without losing accuracy? So I'm going to talk about um, a paper called um, Concept Whitening uh, that, um, that does exactly this. Okay, so convolutional neural networks, as you know, are not naturally disentangled. So if you want to look at where the information about any concept is flowing through the network, it usually flows through the whole, the whole network. Um, so we usually don't have like a, a node that is responsible for all the information about airplanes. And we usually don't have another node that's responsible for all the information about cars, right? What I'm, what I'm saying is that the information about these concepts needs to, you know, needs to go only through this node so that after you hit that node, um, the only information that the network is using about airplane has gone through that node, okay? But that's usually not the way CNNs um, work. If you want CNNs to, to do this, you have to ask them to do it. They won't do it naturally. Okay, so what people have been trying to do is they've been creating what are called concept vectors. So they'll take a layer, say like a batch norm layer, and they'll send a whole bunch of, you know, concepts through the network, like airplanes and cars, you know, pictures of airplanes, cars and trucks and so on. They'll send them through the network and figure out which nodes are activated. And then um, placing each node along an, an axis, they'll send a vector um, in the direction of, say, the airplane images and the car images. So in this case, I'm looking at the, a projection onto the space of neuron, neuron 1's activation versus neuron 2's activation. And uh, here I have um, different concept vectors pointing toward different concepts. But there's a problem with, with what I'm showing you here because, as you can see, these concepts are not naturally orthonormal. So here I have concept 1 and concept 2's concept vectors both pointing in the same direction, even though concept 1 and concept 2 are actually different. Um, and so, um, you know, you also have other problems too where the concepts could be floating around latent space. They don't even need to be concentrated in the latent space. So that's the problem, and that's why uh, neural networks are not, you know, naturally uh, disentangled. So we designed this technique that it's kind of like principal component analysis for neural networks. And what it does is it, it actually creates a whitening of the space um, to, to sort of put these concepts along the axes. Okay, so when a concept whitening module is added to a CNN, the latent space is whitened, which means um, decorrelated and normalized. So it's like making it more like white noise, right? Um, and the axes of the latent space are aligned with these concepts that we're actually interested. So you, we will actually have like an airplane axis and a car axis or whatever concepts we're actually interested in. Okay, so, that, so this is kind of like what it does. It, it decorrelates the space, it normalizes it, and then it aligns the space um, with the, the concepts here like that. So neuron one is taking care of all of the information about airplanes, neuron two, all of the information about cars, and so on. Okay, so when the concept whitening module is added to different layers, uh, interesting things happen because if you think about it, like let's say you add the CW module to the second layer of the network. In that case, 
there's, you know, there's not much that a neural network can learn in two layers. But remember, all of the information about a concept is forced to go through only one neuron, right? So it's all the information that it's using about airplane to predict whatever it's predicting has to go through one neuron. And so in that case, it has to create an abstract notion of an airplane in that second layer. Um, so in this case, uh, it, it did, it, cr it created a, a very abstract notion of an airplane that it could, that it could sort of learn in two layers. And it looks like uh, none of these images, these are the most highly activated images along that axis. And none of them are airplanes, <laughs> um, but they're all images with blue backgrounds and gray or white objects in the middle which you can think of as kind of like an abstract notion of an airplane that you could learn uh, just in two layers. And then uh, here it's placing information about uh, beds along the bed axis. Um, so all the information that the network is using about beds to detect whether an image is a bedroom, um, that's going through that one, that one bed neuron. And um, it's invented a concept that seems to be something like warm colors. And then for the person axis, it seems to really like kind of these stringy textures. Um, yeah, so it's kind of neat. So that's what happens if you add CW to the like an early layer, the second layer. But if you add the CW layer to the like a later layer, um, like the 16th layer, for instance, the concept information is really represented nicely along the axes and it's it's showing you that the most highly activated images for that neuron are actually airplanes for the airplane neuron beds for the bed neuron and people for the person neuron okay so um what are the advantages of cw over just using the regular batch norm well first of all we're not sacrificing any accuracy we did extensive experiments and you, if you add in the cw layer you're not, you're not losing any accuracy over the black box. It's, the accuracy is right on par with standard CNNs. It's also really easy to use. If you start from a black box model um, that's already trained, it only requires one additional epoch of further training after you put the CW module in. So in other words, you just have to go through each observation in the data set once um, uh, to, to, to um, incorporate the CW module. And um, I will mention that you know, it does require some extra effort to use it because you need to have training data to define what the concepts are that go along the different axes. Um, but if you have that additional data, then this is really easy to use. And again, it doesn't, doesn't sacrifice accuracy over black box models and it disentangles the latent space. So it's like, a, like I said, you, you can kind of think of it as um, principal component analysis for neural networks. Okay. So um, what I've shown you is something that is, that is sort of strictly better than post hoc concept vectors. Because the concept vectors, you can have multiple concept vectors that point in the same place, and they don't really characterize um, where the information, you know, what really uh, the information is and, and how it's traveling through the network. Whereas with concept whitening, it forces those concept vectors to be along the axes, so you know exactly um, how the information is, is being disentangled as it travels through the network. Okay, so I've given you two examples of um, interpretable neural networks that don't seem to lose any accuracy over their black box counterparts. Um, and so I've, uh, you know, I've kind of addressed these, these two different problem types in, in very different ways, but in both cases, uh, I'm seeing no, no loss in accuracy over the black boxes. Okay, so just to get back to the, the point of, uh, of this talk, why should we not explain um, black box models and why should we use interpretable models instead? Uh, well, the main reason is that uh, we don't really seem to need black box models in the first place. And so uh, we, there's no real point in designing these explanation methods that lend authority to the black box when the truth is that um, we could simply replace these black box models with with inherently interpretable models that actually provide their reasoning processes rather than us trying to, trying to infer them. All right, thank you very much.